Strategic default is fast becoming a new buzz phrase in the mortgage world. That's when a homeowner walks away from a property when the investment is underwater. In fact, in many cases, people who strategically default have the money to pay the mortgage, but they decide that it's better to default. Whole industries have sprung up to support the notion of strategic default. Websites like youwalkaway.com advise clients about the process of strategically defaulting and the steps you can use to minimize the damage. But my next guest says it's a bad idea. Frank Pallotta, managing partner of Loan Value Group, joins me here on set. Mr. Pallotta, welcome to Bloomberg's Bottom Line. Thanks so much for coming on. Thanks for having me. Why is it a bad idea? Well, I think uh, over the last few years, what we found is the incentive to stay in the home has disappeared with the decline in uh, in mortgage uh, and the decline in home values. <clears throat> And what uh, borrowers have found is with the uh, with their investment now gone, they need to look at the other uh, assets in their life. They need to look at other responsibilities that they have. And they are choosing to take that mortgage asset that they had and walk away, much like when you own a stock yeah. and the value of the stock drops. So I think it's a bad idea. Clearly, walking away may help the individual because they're able to reset their personal income statement or their personal balance sheet. But what but does it do to the community? It what does, does it do to the tax base and to property values? Exactly right. You're seeing uh, a lot of these communities, especially in Nevada, mm -hmm. uh, in the Arizona areas, where you know, you're seeing 50, 60, 70 percent uh, foreclosure rates. Yeah. And clearly, you can see decline in home values continue to accelerate, much like Lori Goodman talked about the other day. Uh, Dr. Robert Schiller, he made an important point in his latest report, and we thought that we'd put that up on the screen for some of our viewers to see. Mm -hmm. Dr. Schiller put it this way. He said that prior to the recent boom, the general view was that a mortgage was a binding contract to repay a loan over a specified time. Increasingly, it's become essentially a simple put option back to the holder of the mortgage, and it continued. Loan modifications have as many as 12 million households asking, why not me? And the term strategic default has come into <coughs> widespread use. Is he accurate? Uh, he is accurate. A lot of people are saying, why not me? And they're looking at their neighbors who are relieving themselves of 40, 50, 60, 100 thousand dollar debt obligations. And now they've got money, not necessarily to spend on anything that's extravagant, but a lot of these people are looking at what's in their best interest, which in some cases may be their family and maybe some other things like a job that may be two, three, four hundred miles from them that they may, in order to keep their family safe and secure, they may have to walk away from that. But basically what we're talking about, these people need help. Are they getting help? Is anybody listening to them? You know what, the, 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 the HAMP modification and some of the government programs that are out there, they help, but they help mostly on the affordability side. Mm -hmm. There are really no programs out there to help um, what we call the borrower's balance sheet or help their negative equity. So I think that's something that really needs to be needs to be looked at. You note, and, and correctly <coughs> so, because I haven't heard this said a lot, that uh, payment operations for the mortgage service industry were built to deal with a loan delinquency rate of 2%. Mm -hmm. What's that rate right now? Oh, it depends on the organization, but it's well north of 10, in a lot of cases, 12 to 15% delinquency rates. They you don't have the infrastructure you to handle this. You say that the banking industry has been in a bunker <clears throat> mentality. What do you mean by that? Well, w when you've got an operation that's built for 2 or 3% delinquency rates, um, it's typically a two-way conversation with 2% of the borrowers that you have. When it jumps to 5, 8, 10, 20%, you don't have the infrastructure, you don't have the, 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 the bodies to actually take the incoming calls. And when you have to deal with strategic default, they're outgoing calls that you have to make. So the bunker mentality is really them playing defense, and they don't have the, the, the guns in place to play defense, let alone an offensive strategy. Is there any way they can employ an offensive strategy? You know, it, 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 it's tough with the numbers that we have and the numbers that, that some of the, the, the people are talking about coming down the road, they, they don't. I mean, the only way they can solve for it is try to bring more bodies in, but you know, you're seeing recidivism rates on some of the, uh, some of the HAMP modification um, programs that run 50 and 60 percent. So even the ones that you fix are coming back a lot faster than anyone suspected. No, I mean, when I was reading some of the research, there was something that jumped out at me and it seems so simple, but at the same time, it seems so heartbreaking. Mm -hmm. The paperwork is making this worse. It's it's horrible. We think it's the number one reason you see recidivism rates so high. Really? Additional disclosures, the burden. I mean, you're asking borrowers to fax information in. I don't know how many borrowers have fax machines at home, hmm. but, but the operational hurdles that these banks have, and it's really not their fault, 
and that's not what they were built for, is one of the larger reasons. Additional disclosures and, and documentation exchange. When does this turn around? I realize you don't have a crystal ball, but I just <laughs> I feel like I, I need to ask because you're on the front lines of this and you see this. Does it turn around? Do American homeowners get the help that they need? And maybe a third question, because I've asked some other guests this, mm -hmm. Is this a generation now where we're going to see that the dream of having a home in the United States is just out of reach for a lot of people and we're going to have a generation of renters? Well, look, I, I think home ownership is probably, you know, a, a bit in the decline for now. And I'm just it's just what I'm reading here. But but I think we're going to be a decade of home prices bouncing along the bottom where we are now. But there was that sentiment that if you don't own a home in the, you know, if, they, if you don't own, uh, own a home in the United States, that means you haven't made it. Well, look, I, I, I do think, you know, borrowers really buy a home, just so you know, for two reasons. They buy a home for shelter and they buy a home for an investment. Well, some people bought it for an ATM, too. <laughs> this is true. This is true. And I don't think that's ever going to happen again, um, honestly. I, I think, you know, you, you had a second lead market that was secure for a while. It was just when you combine the ability to take equity out of your home with a 98 LTV mortgage, that's when yeah. you sort of ran into trouble. And I want to bring something up because Sheila Bear, the chairman of the FDIC, said it. She said every time servicers have delayed needed changes to minimize their short-term cost, they have seen a deepening of the crisis that has cost them and the rest of us even more. How much is it costing us? Well, in uh, in most defaults around the country, a default costs the owner of uh, the loan about 50 or 60 percent of the value of the home. So uh, the value of the note itself. So you can see if the average value of a home is about $200,000, um, the owner of the loan, which in a lot of cases are the GSEs and the taxpayers, ultimately lose $100,000. So it's pretty substantial. That's 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 a, a figure that, that I have not heard. Do you think a lot of people know that, that the figure is that high? The, the figure is high. I mean, I, I think a lot of people who deal with liquidating a lot of those assets understand where the numbers are. Um, but it, it's certainly a number that's not being discussed. I think the broad-based numbers that are being talked about are how many homes are underwater. And then yeah. to your, what you saw yesterday is Lori Goodman thought, talked about the numbers that she thought uh, that would roll into. And we also have a, a, <laughs> another graphic that I'd like you to react to as well. And this one says the problems are sufficiently widespread that they suggest structural problems in the mortgage servicing industry. It has now become evident that significant parts of the servicing industry also fail to handle foreclosures properly. And that's from Dan Tarullo, the Federal Reserve Governor. If they didn't handle them properly, does that mean that they were asleep at the switch or was it just too overwhelming? Well, look, I know the numbers are, are, are staggering. We've not seen this in the industry forever. We, we don't deal with a lot of banks as far as talking to them about what they do at the foreclosure side. Our company really works to prevent the foreclosure from happening. But you, you can understand when your infrastructure is stretched the way it is now, things will be missed, things will be skipped. And I, I don't know if it's intentional. I doubt it, but that's what happens. How much of a hit do banks take on the original loan when these strategic defaults happen? Well, it's interesting. Banks don't typically hold the first lien. Mm -hmm. um, they originate the loan and it's sold off to either private investors or Fannie and Freddie. So when a loan goes delinquent or a loan goes into foreclosure, they don't have that frontline risk. The, the mortgage insurers and the GSEs and ultimately the taxpayers do. What the banks do suffer in is if they hold a second lien. If the first goes down, it's really only a matter of time or maybe the second lien goes down before the first lien goes down. And those numbers are pretty substantial. The banks do hold most of the second liens. In fact, the top four banks hold about 75% of all the outstanding second liens. Is there anything Congress can do to alleviate this? And I, and I mentioned that under the specter of we've been hearing a lot about proposed cuts that uh, Congress wants to make. And one of those cuts in particular has to deal with helping people who are facing foreclosure, maybe are underwater in their homes. Is this something that can be legislated? You know, I, I'm, I, I don't know. If we're talking about widespread principal forgiveness or somehow looking at the negative equity, yeah. it's, it's, it's very tough. Um, th there are accounting rules, there are legal rules around uh, maybe your loan that may be in a security versus my loan that may be held on portfolio by yeah. a bank. So the path to get to a, a strategic default solution um, can take many different, uh, different roads. What role did Fannie and Freddie play in all of this? 
And, and, I, and I mention that because I noticed your reaction when Sue Keenan was talking about those Wells notices that were sent out. Mm -hmm. what, what's the specter of all of that? Well, Fannie and Freddie, you know, clearly they, they, they stood behind, you know, a, a great number of loans that are originated. Um, and Fannie and Freddie, and again, this is only because I know and I've been in the industry, mm -hmm. is they, they are the guarantor of, of the loans themselves. So, uh, you know, when you hear that Fannie and Freddie are under investigation, it's really just a question of, you know, they own a lot of risk on their balance sheet and they own a lot of risk both directly and indirectly. So you certainly hope it's something that everyone can get their hands on. Might I ask in our last minute, sure. because this is a topic obviously mm -hmm. that's been covered for the last couple of years, particularly during the downturn. Mm -hmm. Where did we get it wrong? Where did the media get it wrong? Was it underreported? Was it not reported at all? What, did, what, did, what could we have done better to get the word out that this is a problem that is significant and it's something that's going to be with us for a while? You know, I, I, a lot of people have asked me that and a lot people in the industry as well. And, and honestly, there, there's no single victim or villain. There, okay. there really isn't. Everyone along the way, um, from, from the homeowner, who you can also put some blame on, um, to the originator, to the Wall Street firm that securitized it, even to the end investor, there are victims and villains all along the way. And I think it's, you know, it's a question, a bit of oversight and a bit of diligence that, that might have been skipped. But uh, there's really no single finger of blame. All right. Frank Pilata, managing partner of Loan Value Group, joining us on set. Pleasure to meet you. Thanks, Thanks so much. Thanks so much. I appreciate it. Thank okay. you.